Hello and welcome to the PMQ webinar series. I'm Brian Hernandez. I'm here with our tech guru, Daniel Lee Perea. Go ahead and show your shiny face, Daniel. There we go. <laughs> Thumbs up. Everybody's ready to go. Um, we are here to kind of guide you through the world of marketing for small businesses. We have our very esteemed guest, Rudy Waldner here, who's going to be speaking on this topic of trench marketing, uh, how to your guide to retail success. So welcome, Rudy. We're glad to have you here. Great to be here. Rudy is a marketing guru and a speaker extraordinaire. He travels the country and the world speaking on this subject, on how to grow your marketing from inside your own store. So um, just briefly, uh, he's back from a whirlwind tour in Costa Rica where he spoke on this very subject. How did that go for you, Rudy? It was great. I spoke at the culinary training school, mm -hmm. and they booked me now to speak to every graduating class. So I'm gonna I'm gonna be back every six months. Oh, that's that's gotta be nice. I'm sure they had some pretty good weather down there. Great weather, great food. Yeah. <laughs> well, um, real quick, uh, how did you come up with this this particular topic? Uh, what was the inspiration for marketing from the trenches? So I I, I went from I came from small businesses, right? My mm -hmm. um. My family owned a delicatessen in New York, so I worked, uh, worked being on the counter there. And then I joined Corporate America, and I saw these million-dollar budgets spent on electronic media. Meanwhile, the locations that I was managing, it was the management that drove the bottom line, not the budget that was spent on electronic media. Oh, okay. So is that kind of the inspiration for the title, Marketing from the Trenches? Is a, what, is that, exactly. what exactly does that mean? That means from, from bottom up, you're working in the trenches, you're rolling up your sleeves, you're getting it done yourself. Perfect. Well, we are going to let Rudy take over here in just a minute. I want to remind everybody that um, if you're coming in late, you can view this recording at pmq.com slash webinar. You can catch the whole intro um, if you missed a few slides, any information. Um, we are also going to be taking questions. Um, if you look to the side of your little taskbar, you can see a question section, and our tech guru, Daniel Prey, will be cataloging those and make sure that we hit all the, the really good questions later on. Um, also, if you are capable of speaking through a microphone, um, please note that in your question because we can actually unmute you and let you speak to Rudy one-on-one, -on -one, uh, which is a little more personable than, you know, just texting. So uh, without further ado, we are going to hand it off to Rudy and let him enlighten everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. So uh, welcome. The first uh, page I have up says an operations-based program. So what I mean by that is just everything that you yourself can do to drive your business. So this is not about the internet. It's about what I call the outer net, right? So I'm not talking about Google. I'm talking about going to a library. I don't tweet. I speak to people kind of like I'm doing now. I go to a bookstore and I buy an Amazon, that kind of thing. Why this is important. 90% of businesses close year one. In the restaurant business, 90% close in under seven months. Of the 10% that survive year one, 80% close in year two. So out of 100 businesses opened, two will survive into year three. That's brutal. That's why this is important. So my program, it's based on three Ps. Your people, your place of business, and your business partners everything that you control. Your people. Your business's greatest asset is your people. I call this the arc of success. GE uses this. If wherever I speak, wherever I manage, whatever company I join, I've tried to break this, but I, but I can't. If I ask a, a professor, a CEO, a COO, a restaurant owner, a teacher, rank their people from one to five, I always get the same thing. One being the best, five being needs to get fired now, I always get the same answer. Let me explain a little further. So your ones are your superstars, your bonus earners. Your twos are great employees. Your threes are your whelmers. They don't, uh, they don't underwhelm you, they don't overwhelm you, they do just enough to get by. Your fours are your borderline cases. And your fives, I, I said it nice here, need to be upgraded. They need to go like right now. So everyone I've asked ever to rank their people, I always get the same answer. I have zero percent that need to go right now. I got zero fives. Ten percent of fours, 
40% of my crew does just enough to get by, 30% are great, and 20% are awesome. That's what everyone thinks. Here's the actuality. This is the actuality. This is what I've walked into every time. 10% need to go right now. 15% are borderline cases. 50% do just enough to get by. 15% are great, and 10% are outstanding. And I think one of the biggest points today, if not the biggest point, is, is this. In corporate America and in small business, I mean everywhere, we always waste our times on the fours and the fives, right? Uh, can you believe what she's wearing today? Can you believe he's late again, right? What happens to the fours and fives, sorry, what happens to the ones and twos when you waste all your time on the fours and fives? Your ones and twos either slip into a three, doing just enough to get by, or they quit. So the lesson to be learned here is pop your number fives, tell your fours what they need to do to make it, and treat your ones and twos good. Come up with incentives, um, theme days, it doesn't have to cost money, right? So treat your great people great, uh, treat your good people great, and uh, cut, your, uh, cut your fives, and here's what happens. This is a beautiful thing. One in 10 still needs to go, but that's not what this is about, right? This is about treating the good people right, 70% become number twos, 20% become number ones, right? So, and they alternate category, they, they alternate the category uh, every week or so. So you got 90% of your people that care driving your business. And that's a much better model than the one you probably walked into. So what, may, what motivates employees? There's uh, two perspectives I'm gonna share here from a super, supervisor's point of view or from the employee's point of view. Supervisors think that a good wage is the number one employee motivator. The employee considers that actually number five. Supervisor, supervisor thinks it's number two for job security. Employees actually think uh, job security is the number four most important thing. Number three for a supervisor's perspective is upward mobility that is number seven to an employee. Good working conditions, number four to a supervisor. It's actually number nine to an employee. Interesting work, number five in the supervisor's mind. Actually six for an employee. Management loyalty is number six. Actually number eight to an employee. Tactful discipline is number seven. It's actually number 10 to an employee. But that doesn't mean it's okay to yell at someone on the floor, right? I mean, it's still top 10, so be nice. Appreciation, a supervisor thinks that's number eight. To an employee, that's actually number one. Understanding attitude is number nine. In the supervisor's perspective, it's actually number two to an employee. And feeling in is uh, number 10 in the supervisor's uh, mind. It's number three to an employee. And how much do those cost? Nothing. Treat good people right. Here's another look at this from bottom up, from the employee's perspective. Tactful discipline is number 10. Good conditions, number nine. Management loyalty, number eight. Upward mobility, number seven. Interesting work, number six. Good wages, number five. Job security, number four. Feeling in, number three. Understanding attitude, number two, and appreciation is number one. Again, top three things are free. <coughs> so to summarize, your employees are the face of your brand and your greatest asset. Treat the good ones great and stop wasting your time on the underperformers. Remember, a subpar employee doesn't do something because they can't or they won't. And there's no room in your payroll for either of those. Hey, Rudy, really quick, um, where did the numbers come from for um, that survey? I, I believe that was Entrepreneur Magazine. Okay. Is that something you do uh, independently on your own as well? Or? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Thank you for asking that. Yeah, I do a blind survey at least every three months, and it, and it hits on some of those points or all of those points every three months. Depends on what I'm looking for, but blind surveys – Blind, truly blind employee surveys are a wealth of information. Okay, great. Thank you. You're welcome. All right, the next P is your place, your place of business. 
in the restaurant business, cleanliness equals credibility, right? We all know that. Everybody knows that. Um, I, I teach it at the uh, culinary schools. Everyone knows it. Yet, how many restaurants you go into where the bathroom is destroyed? It's insane. Cleanliness equals credibility. Every uh, every piece of glass, countertop, or metal should be shining in your place. Um, endorsements also give credibility. I call it the wall of fame where um, you hang up, I don't know, pictures of celebrities or newspaper articles that you were in or thank you letters, that kind of thing. So that also builds your credibility. And then another easy one, the five senses, right? How do you relate to the five senses? How, how can you cater to every sense to make a customer's experience better? So sight, sound, smell, and taste. Sight, first of all, maximize your signage. Uh, the larger the sign on the outside, the better for you. Black on white can be seen from the furthest distance, and different colors mean different things. Sound is an easy one, right? You should have, uh, you should play the appropriate music. Uh, the music from the kitchen shouldn't bleed out onto the floor, right? Smell is easy in the restaurant business. Um, I've got a, a friend that has a restaurant in Atlanta, and if everyone gets seated at once, sometimes that happens. He walks around the dining room with um, broiled or broiling, I should say, garlic. So everyone wants to order an appetizer right away because they're salivating. So smell is easy, easy to control. Taste, unless you're on a real low price point, I mean, quality is everything. And touch in a small business, uh, a handshake goes a long way. So sight, maximize your logo usage by using on all printed materials, included bags, banners, receipts, mailers, etc. Uh, and then line maps. I'm going to show you an example of a line map. Someone asked me to show that, so I've added that, I think, to the next slide. So I'm not saying spend a lot of money here, though. What, what I use uh, is I get a rubber stamp with whatever brand, and you can stamp your, your pizza box. You can stamp your bag. You can stamp uh, your receipts with that. I mean, that's $12 instead of paying for custom printing. That's an option. And a line map, which I'll show you a, a picture of, is like the cross streets that your business is on and maybe an anchor that um, everyone should recognize. Um, every of a in English, I know. Every color stands for something. Red is the first color that the eye processes. Black on white can be seen from the furthest distance. So um, the outside sign should probably be black on white. And Inside, I mean, you know, have fun with the with the with the colors because they all mean something else, right? Uh, green Starbucks means growth. Pink Victoria Se Victoria Secrets is playful, but on the outside, black on white goes the longest way. So here's a picture of a line map. I was running that uh, that movies video store across the street. So then you see the main street, then you see two big shops, and then you see this, uh, two, you know, you might recognize Sizzler or Pier 1. And behind that was this little coffee shop. This guy couldn't help himself. So we did a, a business partnership together where this was just a business card. It has a line map on this side, and on the other side was a frequency program that him and I did together. So for $24, we had an advertising piece that we both handed out to our customers. And we'll get into business partnerships shortly, but this is a line map. Sound, like I said, you might not want to play rap in a dentist's office. Always play something appropriate. You know you've been in, the, in that place where the wrong thing was on. So don't let that happen to you. Smell, smell is powerful. In the restaurant business, that's kind of easy, right? But um, I'll just I'll read this for you, and then the other examples give it even more credibility. A subtle aroma has a potent effect on shoppers. When we smell something, it activates the limbic system, which triggers emotions, memories, and a sense of well-being. When a prospect is presented with an enjoyable scent and visual image, they perceive the experience to be more pleasant and memorable, right? Just by smell. So Sony has their own smell blend. Um, when you open the door to walk into a Sony store, there's a vanilla blend that, I don't know, makes, makes the experience better. And then this Nike example I like that. I got that from Men's Health. A floral scented room, like, so two rooms, same sneaker, one room smells like flowers. So 84% preferred the room, the sneaker in the room that smelled like flowers, and it had a $10 higher perceived value, that sneaker. So that goes a long way. Uh, taste. So 
in the restaurant business, right, you have a real hook with the, with the uh, taste. Um, you can get into other businesses by cross-promoting yourself, right? So uh, exposure to your customer base, um, sampling, drive, sampling drive sales 600%, exposure to your customer base, and adding value at no cost to you. So that is how you uh, build a business partnership. And I'm going to go into that into detail, but let me give you an example of how that all works. If I'm in the food industry and I have a, another business and that I partner up with, I can use the anchor or the, or the draw of the food industry. An example from my past was I used to run um, a loan chain. And whenever I go to a location that I would manage or, or purchase, I'd walk in every direction uh, 10 minutes and see who I could business partner with, right? So in the strip mall, at the end of the strip mall was a Sara Lee bakery that was doing sampling. Uh, that sampling means when they give little samples of the food to their customers. Sampling drive sales 600%. I know, I know you've seen that at malls and stuff. So this guy is doing sampling in the strip mall. I said, why don't you come down to my loan store, hand out your coupons, uh, let my customers sample your, your goods, and it'll drive your business 600%. So what I have to offer him as a loan store is exposure to my customer base. It drives his sales 600% and my customers get added value and it doesn't cost me anything. So that's a look at the business partnerships or that kind of is the business partnerships where I just, I just jumped in early and I'll, I'll talk about it again later. That's taste though, that's how, that's how that all works. And then touch in small business, a handshake seals the deal. If a prospect spend 30 seconds instead of just 10, se 10 seconds touching an object, they'd be more willing to pay for it. Touch begins to form an attachment in less than one minute. Okay, so that's like a take the call for a test drive kind of thing. So that's, that's touch. Some other concepts on and inside your place. Um, floor or intercept marketing is the, the fancy word for it, but I like, it, I like to call it the third in line, right? So if you have a line, the person you're dealing with, they're happy. The next person, the person behind them, they're happy too. Hey, I'm next. It's good. The third and beyond, though, that's the ones, especially, I don't know where I'm from in the Northeast, the third and back, if I'm not getting attention, I might not, I, I'm, I might not endure the line. I might go to another place. So try to establish eye contact with the third and back and say, hey, I'm getting to you. I'll get right there. So that's the third in line. And I know we all know this, but I don't know. I just keep hearing it. Do not use yes or no questions. How you doing? That's okay. Can I help you? That's an immediate no. I'm just looking, right? Um, how, how's the weather? Let's try to engage. Um, the door or the greeting. I like this blockbuster used to do this. Um, every time someone walks in, they're greeted with eye contact. Also, in the restaurant business, you need to let them know. You need to let a prospect know, do they seat themselves or should they wait to be seated? The phone is a big deal, right? You have a, you have a, you can really screw up a relationship by not answering the phone right. So just uh, high energy, um, your tone should be happy. They should be able to kind of hear your smile. It's a big deal. And also on the phone, your uh, after hours message should be just as peppy and should also have, I don't know, whatever uh, specials you're going to have kind of thing. And, and then if you have a fancy system, the, the hold music should probably be something about booking a, booking a holiday uh, event early. You know, so always be selling, always be closing. And then exit. Uh, no one leaves empty handed. So anyone that comes to you should always leave with something. A business card at the very least, some kind of, I don't like the coupon, but uh, I like some kind of incentive to come back. Um, and it should have a line map on it and maybe a referral card, but no one leaves empty-handed. So those are some further retail pro, um, concepts. So partnerships. Ways to form uh, partnerships. The one I talked about with the, with the bakery and the loan store. Other ways to initiate that is through sponsorships, on-site events, off-site events, and sampling. Sampling drives sales how much? 600%, that's correct. Uh, an on-site event, it, again, it, Way, uh, way easier in the food industry. I liked. Um, I used to run a chain in Florida, and Fazoli's 
is uh, some kind of fast food Italian. And they used to give me free meeting space if all my managers, you know, ate lunch there. So there's, there's so many different ways to cross promote or begin business partnerships. So what are the three P's? Your people, your place, and your business partnerships. So a little bit more about business partnerships, because I, I know it's vague, it's, and I don't mean to be vague, but it's absolutely specific to your location. Wherever you are, walk 10 minutes in every direction and start thinking, how can we cross promote each other? Go to who you know. So what business did you come from, or what group do you belong to, or what business do you know about? Uh, your business neighbors, who's next door, they, they should be able to promote you better than you. And where does your customer go? This is from uh, the four-hour work week, which I've read, and I'm still you know, working slightly more than that. Which social, industry, and professional groups do you belong to, have belonged to, or do you understand? Look creatively, look creatively at your resume, work experience, physical habits, and hobbies, and compile a list of the groups, past and present, that you can associate yourself with. So just start that list, and it'll keep, I'm, I put it on my refrigerator, and it'll keep growing as you start remembering stuff. I'll give you one more example about partnerships uh, because it goes to who you know, right? So I, I've, I've done martial arts for years. So I used to run a video rental chain back in the Stone Age. And there was this uh, karate school chain that I was able to partner with because I knew how to approach them, right? You don't interrupt the class. You take your shoes off when you walk in. So I was able to get a karate school that had, I don't know, 20-something locations in the Northeast partner up with my 20-something location video chain that I was running. And on a Saturday, they do demonstrations either in the parking lot or inside uh, my video store. I signed up as um, video renters. I signed up the karate school students on, the, on my student discounts. They got exposure to my customer base, so they gave away a free year of karate. So again, it, it's so unique. You couldn't, you, know, you couldn't think of that unless you, you were in that location and you, you had that particular background. So it's, it's uh, looking at your specific location for opportunity. All right, here's some proof. I think this first slide is terrible. Yes, this first slide is terrible. Um, so I'll, I'll, I'll kind of read it to you. This was a, a group of, I think, eight stores in Kentucky that I opened. And I just had my managers ask the first 100 customers, how'd you hear about us? And the biggest draw the 55% was from the sign, and then the second biggest, the 25%, was from referrals. So, it, go ahead. I feel a question coming on. <laughs> just, uh, just you know, if you can let us know what the other two are, because it's a little hard to see. So, the 25% oh. were referrals. Okay, uh, and so this will date this a little bit. 17% was from the phone book, <laughs> and 3% was from flyers. But, but the bigger point then is 80% is under my control of the first hundred customers that came in. This was from a bigger chain, um, 20 something states, six million dollar advertising budget. The number one reason people came into our store was a sign, the location. The number two reason was customer service or referrals, 20 something percent, it's always about 25 percent. And then returning customers, 20 percent. So 90 percent of the customers in this business were gained from what was under my control. The other six million was spent on all those advertising um, lines on the bottom of the chart. So I got called out, uh, I think it was last year in Vegas at the Baker's Conference where someone said, you know, phone book, how old is that? So, so those graphs were old. So now I'm a, I'm a partner in a multinational call center and I've used the same principle. So I, I want to show you that it still works and now I have more current dates. So this is just year over year. In 2010 was the bottom line, 2011. I mean, you can't make this stuff up. Stacked increase year over year on unit count. So that's processed units. This is more um, a conversion percentage. So this is efficiencies. Again, stacked, stacked increases year over year, 2010, 11, and 12. So, for example, um, the bottom line, 6 out of 10 would convert. So I got 
potential prospects. Sorry, I got ten potential co prospects. I converted six, then six, uh, six point eight, and then seven. I mean, you can't make this stuff up. Treat good people right. Have a stellar uh, place of business and business partner with things that make sense, and you're going to grow your business. This uh, I have for you guys. Uh, if you want to write it down, or I can email it to you. This is uh, close to the last. I think it's the last slide, right? This is a simple business plan. I don't like those those big wordy ones. But so, what's the purpose of your plan? Do you want market share? Do you want to be more profitable? You know, that's very specific. Um, what are your product's benefits? So, what differentiates differentiates you from your competitor? Who's your target audience? I always like that. Who do you want? that customer to be that walks through your door and then make everything speak to that person. The music, you know, what's on TV, if you got a TV in there, the menu, everything. Um, what tools, what trench marketing tools will you use? What do you stand for to a customer? So that's when you do a, a blind survey, right? Um, fill, fill us out and, I don't know, get a free appetizer with uh, with the purchase of two meals, so you're not giving away too much, right? But then get a blind survey, they seal the envelope, and find out what they really think about you. And what's your or your company's uh, personality? So are you fun? Are you not fun? Are you formal? Are you family oriented? And what's your budget? So seven simple, not that simple, but the simple sentences, the concepts might not be that simple, but that's the foundation of your growth. Thank you very kindly. Hit me with questions. All right, Daniel, do we uh, have a couple questions out there? Yeah, we got a question on, uh, on the subject of motivating your good employees. How do you better motivate those employees? How do you treat good people right? And what are some examples? Uh, so back to the restaurant business. I used to be a waiter, and whoever sold the most specials, got to leave early and didn't have to do the side work. That's, and that costs nothing, right? So that's, that's one way. What I do, I do a lot of team building here because I have a small budget for it. And I let everyone vote on what they want to do. So then we'll do like an offsite event. I do a lot of casual dress days because so that day they don't have to pay for dry cleaning. Um, I like to give away logo shirts. So they're advertising for me and they get a free shirt, that kind of stuff. You want more? I got more. Tell us more. Okay. <laughs> you, know what, you know what I like? If you have someone that has some potential, I like to make them manager of the day. So you have them make your decisions or your, your line cooks decisions or the ordering decisions. And that, A, it relieves you of a little bit of work. B, it develops them. And that's, that's how they get their education. That's great. Um, now... <clears throat> I had something real quick. You were talking about um, like the wall of fame stuff for your customers and so on. I, I used to run a pizzeria, and we had we started this thing where we had this giant cork board in our lobby, and we would let kids bring in pictures, put them up there, and give them a free bag of breadsticks. I mean, how important is the customer interaction with the store? Is that does that help? Is it not it's necessary? Huge. Or it's huge. It's what it's what makes you part of the neighborhood. Mm -hmm. The more stuff you do like that, the better. I I, I love that. I used to have, in the video stores I ran, I used to do a whole wall of that painted chalkboard so the kids could scribble on there instead of my walls. Yeah, exactly. That's good. Um, I'm getting, still getting a few more in here. Um, there was one somebody was wanting to know, um, you were mentioning some of uh, the colors and what they mean. Do you, do you have kind of a, a brief rundown of the rainbow, <laughs> what all the colors yeah, kind of mean? I do, but, but it's in my book. So I, I don't remember it. I, I know uh, purple is uh, royal, uh, black is formal, red is the first color the eye sees. Uh, is green honest? You said growth earlier. Right. Then, but, but in clothes, it's uh, I had the it's in my book. I'm so sorry. And I, I tell you the page, but I don't I don't know it. That's fine. We'll we'll go ahead and put that up on the website. And let everybody know what the colors of the rainbow mean. Yeah. Um, Daniel, you have any uh, any others that you've seen? Yes, uh, Carl B. Reed wants to know where are you located. 
I live right outside of Kansas City right now. Specific and address so we can send you a cake. <laughs> As for PMQ Magazine, we are based in Oxford, Mississippi. I agree, Carl. I love the Midwest, too. I'm from Indiana. so. Um, now, I heard you saying um, let people know if it's seat yourself or you know, wait to be seated. How important is that? I mean, can people tell when they come in? It's not busy. I'm just going to sit down or... No. That, that, that is so upsetting to me, especially if you travel. You never know what it is. You never know. So either you... you I, I love this. You seat yourself because you've been to like, I don't know, Vienna. It's all, you know, if you're lucky if you find a seat. <laughs> but then if you, do, if, you sit, if you sit in New York, they're like, you know, they, they move you, you know? So... <laughs> Every, every town is different, every city is different, every restaurant is different. So you, you just put up a sign. Please wait to be seated or seat yourself. It's that, it's that simple. That almost goes along with customer interaction, too. Don't leave them standing at the door not knowing what to do. So. Yeah, well that, I, I quote in the book also, manners are respect for other people, and that's all part of that. That's a good quote. I'm going to put you under the gun here. Slide 31, you were showing it was a bar graph of uh, what worked for you best uh, with customer interaction, referrals, and so on and so forth. I noticed that online was missing from there. What's, now what are your thoughts on, on online tactics for marketing and so on? I think, I think online is, it, you know, it's, it's just fragmenting advertising even more than it already was. I think any, I think every way that you could hit your prospect with the same message is is great. I think all the online stuff is deceptive because it's called free, but you're burning hours. But uh, but I think it works hand in hand with everything you do. Again, the same message on on Facebook, Twitter, your your uh, your greeting when you answer the phone, mm -hmm. your signage, your menu. I mean, it, it it's got to be a consistent message, and then. You, it could be that much more, I don't want to say overwhelming, but um, influential to the prospect. So is it more of um, sustain, sustainability? Is it, I mean, if we're trying to gain new customers, how, do you, how important do you think online marketing is? Yeah, new customers, I, I would use online to cater to existing customers and then offer a customized referral program to drive new customers through your existing customers. That's how I would okay. exploit the power of online. <laughs> Perfect. Now, um, you gave a lot of really, really good tips. Do any of these tips work in, because you were kind of leaning towards the, uh, away from the, a lot of the typical marketing avenues that people like to use, like radio, um, as you said, internet and TV and so newspaper. Do any of these tips work hand in hand with that? I mean, would you recommend using some yeah. of the, the walk around your store or? Sure. I think if there's a budget for electronic media, I know um, people are negotiating more and more. So if you're going to spend money on cable TV or radio, always wrap it around an event, right? Mm -hmm. So whatever cross promotion you have in your store or in your business partner store, you can get that on the radio um, even as a public service announcement, depending on how you spin it. So you can get free press that way, or and or um, you could donate something and get free press that way. So yeah, absolutely. You can if there's a budget for it, tie it into everything else I said, and it it'll be that much greater of a message. Okay, so there is room to work with some of the typical avenues, basically. A absolutely, just okay. what they were charging was tough. Yeah. So. I, I personally had one more that I think I saw somebody put up there. Um, it was now we have the three P's, which are your people, your place, and um, partners. Partners. Now, which of those is the most important? So you're starting from the ground up. If you had to pick one, which should you start with first? And you know, obviously, get hit the other two. But what do you think is the the most important one to um, for anybody brand new? Well, in. brand new, if, if the door's not open yet, right, so your place, as you're building out your place, you're going to find the right people, mm -hmm. and you're going to walk around. And I think they're all concurrent. I know that's lame, but <laughs> I don't think it's lame. I, I, think, I really think they're all concurrent. If you're starting with a, with a locked door and a paintbrush, you're going to meet your neighbor, you're going to build out the place to look right, 
and you're going to be interviewing the right people all at the same time. Mm -hmm. Okay, say say for somebody who's been in existence but is struggling and can't figure out why, maybe which one do you think they should focus on first? Uh, look, look at your people. Okay. Do blind do blind surveys right away. I just consulted for a, a financial um, uh, financial uh, services center, and it, it ended up being the guy's partner that, that just sucked. It's it's I'm telling you, your people are the face of your brand. So if if you're hurting, it, it might be the person behind the counter when you're not there. Okay. Well, I think that's everything that I had for you. Daniel, did we get any others while I wasn't looking? No no questions, but a litany of compliments from Carl B. Reed. <laughs> thank you, Paul. <laughs> well, again, thank you guys for joining us. I'm Brian Hernandez, and this is the PMQ webinar series. We'd like to thank our guest, Rudy Waldner. Um, say goodbye, Rudy. Bye, everybody. Thank you. <laughs> we will let uh, we will put this up on pmq.com/webinar as soon as we get it uh, cut down a little bit and just in regular format. And um, anybody who needs a link can email me at brian at pmq.com. If you need me to send you the link, I can do that. And uh, otherwise, you can go back and refer to it um, anytime in the future. We'll keep it up there forever as long as the website is active. So. Once again, we'd like to thank everybody for joining us. Thank you for your time, and we hope to see you next time. Uh, we do have one coming up November 5th uh, for Our Town, um, another marketing webinar. Uh, it'll be free. It'll be Wednesday, October, or I'm sorry, Wednesday, November 5th at 2 p.m., just like this one. So hope to see you guys there. Thank you. Ciao. Ciao.